Jerry, thank you very much indeed. Uh, delightful to be back here. I have absolutely no recollection of having <laughs> stood here 31 years ago, I have to admit. I do have a recollection of meeting with Jerry and colleagues, and uh, in a way, feeling a sense of freedom. I just literally finished with Friends of the Earth and was beginning to work out what needed to happen next in my life as uh, an environmental activist who hadn't quite settled on any one thing. So it was a sort of beginning to be a new stage in my life as an activist. But the reminder that it was 31 years ago is very upsetting to me. Because if you think back over those 31 years, practically everything that we now know about this climate emergency has happened because nothing has happened in the intervening 30 years. That's an extraordinary thing for me to have to stand here and say. And I just want, if I may, to track out a tiny bit of that history because the history often escapes us. It's gone. We tend not to focus on it. We're always focused on what's happening now and what needs to happen in a couple of weeks' time, at COP26, or what needs to happen in two years' time, or in 2030, or even, don't worry about this one, 2050. <laughs> too late by then, so I'm not going to go there this evening. But I do want to just remind ourselves this evening of this very bit of history, because I was watching last night, I don't know whether any of you had a chance to watch the BBC drama last night called The Trick, which is a fascinating piece, a docu-drama, docu where they are beginning to expose a really horrendous story about what happened to a bunch of wonderful climate scientists at the Climate Research Uni uh, Unit at the University of East Anglia in 2009, particularly Professor Phil Jones, who I knew. And at that time, there were a lot of interesting preparations running up to COP15. So we're just about to go into COP26. In 2009, everything was focused on COP15, which was going to be in Copenhagen. And we were all hugely excited about it. I can remember that well. It became, became known as Copenhagen. John Copenhagen, because we are a cheery bunch, given half a chance. <laughs> and last night, I was reminded of just how unbelievably devastating this expose, notional expose of fraud in the research work done by the CIU, by the Climate Research Unit at UAF, just how big an impact it has had. And it encouraged an awful lot of people to say, well, we told you so. All this stuff about climate change, it's really just a big hoax. These scientists are now able to fake some of their own data we really don't need to listen to these extremists, probably one of the most reputable groups of scientists in the world anywhere at that time. We don't have to listen to them because essentially they're distorting the science so they can go on raising money to further their own careers. That was the story. And we still don't quite know how this happened. But a very large amount of the internal email traffic of the CIU was hacked. Still not sure by whom, but it's pretty definite that Russia was involved at some point, and pretty definite that some of the funders of what became known as the climate denial machine, all of those powerful interests in the fossil fuel industry, it's pretty obvious that the money came from there. So a combination of US right-wing oil drenched money plus Russian hackers led to this thing called Climate Gate, as it became known, in the run-up to Copenhagen. It clearly wasn't responsible for the fact that Copenhagen was a complete failure. There were many, many reasons why that particular conference of the parties did not work. Many reasons. But this whole story, the scandal, emerged in the run-up to that COP was definitely a very influential thing. So just before we move on from 2009, which was the date of Climate Gate, just 
Now let's go back closer to when apparently I was last in this hall, about 31 years ago, and go back to 1988, which was the year during which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was set up. In the light of early evidence, it wasn't very solid in those days, but there was a lot of very complex modelling going on, trying to work out what the impact would be if we continue to put all of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And all of that modelling, essentially, led governments to set up the Intergovernmental Panel, which became then the hugely influential science body that it is today. That led to 1992, and you heard Jerry refer to that, to the Earth Summit in 1992, when world government signed up to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is essentially the legal instrument that has led to everything that we have or haven't done about climate change since then. In 1988, IPCC, three, four years later, the Earth Summit, the Framework Convention, and then through from that point, theoretically with a COP, a conference of the parties every year from that point on, a couple of years we missed, uh, last year we missed it, COVID, so we haven't got to uh, where we should have been numerically, but that's why it's COP26 in a couple of weeks' time. That's the record that everybody knows. But the bit that you really will not know is what was happening underneath the surface. In 1978, to go back even further, ExxonMobil instructed its own scientists to do a full scoping of what would happen if oil, gas, and coal consumption grew by roughly 10% per annum for the next 30 years. What would that mean for the world's climate? This is 78. A little bit of science around then. A guy called Stephen Schneider, very influential, very brave scientist. But there wasn't much out there in the public domain. But ExxonMobil's own scientists came back to the board of ExxonMobil and said, whoa, if we project that amount of growth in the consumption of oil and gas, although there wasn't much gas around those days, and gas, we are heading into some massively problematic changes in the global climate. This is their own internal scientific advice. Never published, never acknowledged, the shareholders, regulators, politicians, the general public, consumers of ExxonMobil product. And until quite recently, in fact, no more than about 10 years ago, more or less unknown. From 1978 onwards, all the big oil majors, including the ones that we know better here in this country, Shell and BP, were involved in every conceivable effort to suppress the science of climate change, to make sure that politicians didn't really know what was going on at the time, and to subvert that critical link between science and policy making from 78 on. So by the time the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was launched in 1988, they were already deep into a conspiracy to destroy the scientific base. <clears throat> when the Intergovernmental Panel was set up, they went into panic mode because they said, oh my God, these are serious scientists and they are going to be giving serious advice to government. And the science, as we know, because we've had it sitting on our desk for the last 10 years, is rock solid. So we better do something to butter up this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and to make sure that politicians never listen to its advice. Or if they do, they have other sources of advice as well, which we can obviously help create. So from that point on, all of those big oil companies, plus in particular the American Petroleum Institute, began to invest, to start with, millions, then tens of millions, then hundreds of millions of dollars, into right-wing think tanks like the Cato Institute, the Heartland Foundation, and others to sow uncertainty 
in the science community, to buy compliant scientists who didn't care about their reputation, but loved the Exxon Mobil dollar. <coughs> Started right then, 1991, just before the Kyoto Summit, just the time I was giving a lecture in 30 years. So I look back on that history now, and I don't see what happened in 2009, climate gate as a rare exception. I see it as a, a, just one tiny part of an unfolding record of corruption and deception and fraud. This has been described by the wonderful Bill McKibben, the founder of an organization called 350.org, as the most consequential lie in the history of humankind. And he calls it that because had we acted on the science which was becoming available to us in the early 1990s, I can assure you we would not be in the situation we're in now. We absolutely wouldn't. We would be well on our way to understanding both the opportunities and the upside of living in a ultra low carbon economy. And I'll come on to that in a moment. So that history lives with me a lot. And it means that whether I like it or not, I still feel in tense anger about the degree of immorality that has underpinned that entire industry for the best part of 30 years. And I cannot get that anger out of my system. You can probably hear me giving voice to it this evening. And on behalf of everybody today, but particularly young people today, we have to feel that anger. Because if you don't feel that anger, you will not be aware of the fact that this same group of people now are still committed to slowing down what we need to do now to address the climate emergency. It wasn't an emergency 30 years ago. It was an emerging massive problem, but it wasn't an emergency. Now it is a full-on emergency. But these companies, these power brokers, these right-wing ideologues are still hard at work ensuring that we do not move forward as fast as we now need to do. There's a very interesting phrase circulates in our community, which is we're no longer dealing with climate denial, because there comes a point where however obtuse your political ideas might be, you cannot any longer ignore 100% rock-solid science. So climate denial complete denial of the science has mostly gone. Not completely, obviously with America being the rather weird country it is, there are still significant numbers of people who think the earth is flat. Okay, we just have to live with that. They had Donald Trump as their president for four years. We know that way. So there are still not insignificant pockets of total denial. But by and large, you don't hear that in our media now. The voice I heard today when Radio 4 was picking up on the trick, the documentary, the documentary drama last night, was Lord Lawson's voice. <laughs> Nigel, put that in Lawson. <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer for a long time here in the UK, and he was saying, this fraud, call it fraud, this fraud in the science, shows us that climate change is nothing like what the campaigners are making it out is the nearest thing, pathetic though it may seem, the nearest thing to some of those right-wing think tanks in America. And he set up the Global Warming Policy Foundation in 2009, the Climate Gate. And he is one of those who bear responsibility for everything that has happened during that time and will go to his grave with that responsibility on him. So, where the hell does that leave us now? There's no point me digging any further into the past. I need to move you all on now into the present and into the future. The present is a bit dodgy. I'll try and answer any questions you might have about COP26 in two weeks' time. But it's not hugely encouraging. There's still a lot of confusion going on out there. But some things will be agreed. Politicians 
by and large, world leaders now are not in any way trying to obscure the fact that this is a full-on climate emergency. You've heard politicians the world over give voice to this extraordinary level of rhetoric about how serious a problem it is. Last chance saloon and all that stuff. Boris Johnson is the past master in bullshit rhetoric. <laughs> and they put it out there as if somehow this was proof that they're really doing something about it. It's exactly the opposite. It's proof that they're not doing anything about it, as recognized by Her Majesty the Queen, who was overheard the other day venting her frustration about people who go on endlessly talking about this stuff, but not doing anything about it. It's a shame she hasn't actually mentioned Boris's name personally, because that would be useful. <laughs> So COP26, it'll land some stuff, do some geeky stuff around the Paris Agreement, which was signed up to back in 2015. It'll agree the so-called rule book for Paris, which means we can then implement the Paris Agreement, which we haven't been able to do for six years, because they couldn't agree the rule book. So this is going to be a massive breakthrough in procedural climate diplomacy, if we eventually get the rule book for a six-year-old agreement. You can see how urgent this is. There will be agreement about international finance. By the look of it now, they've secured enough promises from enough of the G20, the rich world countries, to get quite close to the $100 billion a year that is needed to help poorer countries manage the existing impacts of climate change and do something about adapting to future impacts of climate change. So that's encouraging. There'll be a lot more emphasis on nature-based solutions, which I'll come on to in a moment. There'll be a lot more emphasis on the need to address other greenhouse gases, not just CO2, methane in particular. So stuff will happen. But the press releases have already been written. They will announce it as a massive triumph for the UK government. A massive triumph, of course, for Boris Johnson. A wondrous example of nations working really well to sort out a really critical crisis in our midst coming off the back of COVID-19. That isn't going to happen. There is not going to be any sorting out in Glasgow. And the reason for that is that to sort out what we've created over the last 30 years requires a completely different pace of change, a different level of commitment, a different sense of political leadership than anything and just very quickly to spell out how far short of what needs to be done we're going to end up with um, at the end of the 10 days, two weeks in Glasgow. As you probably all know, the Intergovernmental Panel has advised us, trenchantly advised us in its latest report, the so-called Code Red Report, that we still have to keep the average temperature increase to below 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of this century. We're already at one. Two, so that's 1.2 degrees centigrade increase since the start of the Industrial Revolution. We've got 0.3 degrees centigrade to go before we hit 1.5, which the IPCC tells us is likely to happen in about 30 years' time. Roughly 20 years. At that point, the level of disruption that we're seeing now is massively worse than anything we're experiencing right now. And you know how bad that already is. Just remember that every single one of the climate disasters we're seeing now, whether it's wildfires or droughts or storms or whatever, or accelerated melting in ice caps and so on, all of that comes from the historical 1 degree centigrade, 1.2 degree centigrade since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So by the time we get up to 1.5, you can anticipate all of these things are going to be accelerating, intensifying, increased frequency, etc. If we go to 2 degrees centigrade, by the end of the century, uh, fundamentally we're screwed. That's the climate crunch. That's where we are. I can't tell you anything else. That's what my book is all about. It was a very painful book to write because I had to actually re-examine the science in detail for the best part of seven or eight years, I've just kind of taken it for granted because I'm roughly au fait with what's happening. I keep up to speed.
speed with a lot of this stuff, but I hadn't dug deep into the speed of change and the impacts that that change was likely to be. So I had to surface all of that, and I'm not suggesting that any of you who choose to get hold of a copy of Herbert Hell are going to have an easy read. It's not an easy read. But the title is deliberate. It is Hope in Hell. It's not Hell and suck it up. It's hope, because it is not yet too late for humankind to do what needs to be done to stop this descent into a hellish apocalypse. It is not yet too late. And almost all the world scientists subscribe to that. About 10 to 15 percent of the world scientists believe it is already too late to avoid that kind of real apocalyptic outcome, but most scientists believe it can still be done, if we, if we obviously get our act together. And that's what I just want to remind you of. There's no reason why we shouldn't get our act together. From a technology point of view, we have all the technology we need to do what we have to do, to decarbonize, to suck all the greenhouse gases out of our current economy, starting with renewable energy, Moving on from there to a host of different technology-based opportunities, whether that's to do with storage or energy efficiency or smart grids or artificial intelligence or demand management or different transportation systems. Honestly, the technology pipeline is utterly extraordinary. And were we to move to deploy it as fast as we need to, it would make a massive difference. On its own, it wouldn't be sufficient, but it could make a massive difference. So when you're listening to all the news from COP in a few days' time, just remember, we know what has to be done to sort this. We have everything we need at our disposal, not just the technology, but the money. You've probably noticed over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, shitloads of people have got astronomically rich through an economy that basically sucked wealth up from most people, particularly the middle classes as it happened, sucked it up to this 1% of the 1% of the super rich. There are now 2,700 billionaires on planet Earth. They stopped counting millionaires 10 years ago just pointless, because there are so many millionaires. But billionaires continue to grow by about 10% per annum. So we live in a world which is literally awash with money. The question is, how do we get that money, a lot of it nefariously accumulated by exceptionally dodgy, self-serving plutocrats? How do we get that money into doing what now needs to be done to pull us back from this apocalyptic fate of the world? That's not so easy. The politics of that are quite tricky. But it can be done. Lots of people have got lots of ideas about this, which are loved by most people, apart from the 2,600 billionaires. <laughs> so we can do most of this, and we have the resources to do it. The other half of the equation the one that you hear much, much less about, is how we can now revitalize the natural world, bring health and vitality back into the natural world after 50, 60 years of depletion of nature and the natural resources on which we depend, how we can rebuild the natural world as a part of the climate solution. These are called nature-based solutions. And for the first time ever in Glasgow, there is a whole day devoted to nature. Isn't that wonderful? From the last all those climate wonks have woken up to the fact that nature has a bit to do with this, <laughs> and we better start sorting out how we're going to work with nature to start taking back out of the atmosphere some of the billions of tons of CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere over the last 30 years. You can 
see why I'm a bit angry about this. It would have been so much easier not to have put the CO2 in the atmosphere in the first place. But we did at roughly 40 billion, billion tonnes a year, which is what we do now. And we're going to have to take a lot of it back down into our natural, terrestrial and marine systems. Our terrestrial systems, forests, wetlands, soils, bogs, peatlands, etc., etc., and into our marine ecosystems, which is equally exciting, where you hardly ever hear anything about that, into these wonderful marine ecosystems like seagrasses, seaweed, and so on, which can absorb millions, if not billions, of tons of CO2. So we have a whole solutions portfolio <laughs> on healing nature which will simultaneously enable us to address the climate change. I call this the decarbonisation and recarbonisation story. We have to decarbonise our economies by getting the CO2 out of manufacturing, energy, transport, etc. And then we have to recarbonise the natural world by getting CO2 back into those natural systems, soils, forests, seagrasses, etc. Decarbonise, recarbonise. Pretty much it, frankly. If we just decided to go full bore on decarbonize, recarbonize, and we press the panic button, because we need the panic button being pressed, as Greta Thunberg keeps reminding us. If we press the panic button, we still have time to do what needs to be done. This is where you have to come to a political judgment. Do you think this is gonna happen? <laughs> collective political will of our world leaders, and I'm not just talking about our democracies, but I'm talking about some pretty dodgy regime, regimes all over the world, which aren't democracies, or at least certainly not functioning democracies in any respect, and yes, I probably do mean the United States as well in that category. If I look at all of those conditions in those different countries, it's a hell of an ask to get people to move fast enough into a place where this set of solutions to climate change come forward. So, the thing that we might want to explore this evening is, we know what the science tells us, we know what we could be doing to address that science realistically and in time, so not pushing out to 2050, but in the next 10 to 20 years. We then have to work out what it would take to do what we need to do to address the science, and that's where we look at this gap between the politics and the state of play in the world today. I'm pretty sure I might have mentioned some of these things 30 years ago, but it's so much worse now. It is so much worse now. And coming forward with suggestions as to what we're going to do in that area is difficult, which is why I have constantly, for the last 25 years, emphasize the role of other constituencies in our society, in our democracy. The role of progressive business. I've been particularly rude about non-progressive, irresponsible business, particularly the oil companies tonight. But there are many, many companies that get this with the same level of urgency as I've just articulated, and are trying to understand what they can do to make a bit of a difference. It's not just greenwash any longer, it's for real. That's why Forum for the Future has worked with these companies for the last 25 years. There are so many people, people of faith, of deep religious commitment and attachment, who know what this world now looks like and understand the nature of the journey, perilous journey ahead of us, unless things are done very differently. I keep asking the question, when are we going to see an uprising of the world's religions and faith systems, which will actually make a massive difference to the ways in which these malign forces continue to destroy our lives. And perhaps for me, most importantly, not just because I'm here in Cleve School, but for most importantly for me, is the role of young people. And I am very focused on this now, have been since 2018, spent a lot of my time working with young people, with young climate activists, believe that the voice of young people, which was first raised essentially in 2019 with the Strikes of Friday, the School Strikes Movement, 
But that voice is different from any other voice in the climate movement today and commands a sense of respect from politicians which most of the rest of the climate movement fails to do. So for me, there's a really big story for all of us tonight, whatever age we might be, whatever generation, is what can we do to make sure that that voice, the voice of young people, is heard so clearly and so loud and resonates so powerfully in the minds of politicians that they just eventually do what they know they need to do. Find the moral fiber to stop going on betraying young people day after day after day. Because that is what is happening. This is the story of intergenerational justice. Every single day, my generation, by destroying the prospects for young people tomorrow. Every single day. So what's it going to take? How do we get there? And for me, that's the most interesting, exciting, problematic question that I'm looking at today. There has to be an answer to that, because the current <coughs> tactics that are being used to narrow the gap between the science and the politics, that just isn't doing the trick. It's not good enough. So we need a lot more to come into that space. It might be civil disobedience, Extinction Rebellion, Reborn, who knows? They're going through a triple patch at the moment. It might be even more extreme forms of Extinction Rebellion, like Insulate Britain. I seriously hope not, because their tactics are up for spunk. <laughs> it might be a different, a different way of coordinating local action. Don't forget what organizations here in Cheltenham, Bishop's Cleeve, have been able to do to mobilize people in their communities, in the places where they live and they work. Transition Cleave, Vision 21, Jump. These are massively powerful voices of progressive change, but they struggle to get the real support that they need. There are a lot of people who think, yeah, I know they're really important, and I wish them well, but oh God, life's a bit busy at the moment, mate. I'm sure I've got time to include that in my little busy old portfolio. <laughs> who knows, what's the mix gonna be? There will be a mix, and I believe we will rise to that challenge. So that's where I hope the discussion will go this evening. Um, I promised Jerry I wouldn't speak for more than 35 minutes. I'm just about uh, 37, Jerry, sorry about that. Um, and that, that would leave plenty of time for questions and answers, because I never quite know what your interest might be, whether it's in the history of all of this, in the moment we're in at the moment, in the future, in the role of different constituencies, Etc. So we're going to leave the rest to a Q&A session. In this